I'm Alex Michelson. This week, we mark one year since George Floyd's death. And the issue is police reform. We will work until we get the job done. Representative Karen Bass is the author of the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. She joins us to update us on the negotiations with the Senate. Then, the issue is human trafficking. Actress Mira Servino teaming up with Assemblyman Miguel Santiago and activist Jenna McKay. They're standing by with a message for the governor. Plus... It means a lot to so many people. You give hope. You give hope. Adi Barkin is one of the most influential and inspiring activists in America. We speak with him as the issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson, and standing by right there, my guest this week, Congresswoman Karen Bass. She met this week with the family of George Floyd to once again push for legislative change. I stand here to renew the commitment that we will get this bill on President Biden's desk. Congress missed the president's deadline of getting police reform on his desk by this week. Bass is the author of the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. It's passed in the House twice, but hasn't garnered enough Republican support in the Senate. She's currently negotiating with Democratic Senator Cory Booker and Republican Senator Tim Scott. Congresswoman Karen Bass, welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you. Always good to be with you. So where are we at on the negotiations? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> we're, go we're going through it. And you know what? It's funny because uh, as you negotiate a bill like this, it tends to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so uh, it takes time. But what we really decided was as much as I wanted to meet the deadline, because remember now, the bill passed out of the House March 6th. So as much as I wanted to meet the May 25th deadline, it just didn't make sense. We needed more time, and it was more important for us to take the time rather than to rush the process. And it was important to hear from the family that they agreed with that. They were far more concerned about having a substantive bill rather than something symbolic that really wasn't going to bring about the type of change that is needed right now in our country. So what is the main holdup? We've heard that it's over this issue of so-called qualified immunity. Senator Scott has suggested that departments could be held liable, not individual officers. We know that you believe that individual officers should be held liable uh, if they do something wrong. Where are we at on that? So it's not accurate to say that that is one big holdup. It really isn't. It's the fact that this bill is so comprehensive but talking about that for a minute, where I am coming from, my main concern is what can we do to stop these shootings, beatings, death, injury from happening? You know, approximately three people a day are killed in the United States with, a law, uh, with an encounter with law enforcement. And so if you look at the cases, and I looked at over 100 that have taken place since May 25th of last year, so many of them involve people that are in a mental health crisis or it's a substance abuse issue, something related to society that frankly should have never been a law enforcement problem to begin with. And so qualified immunity is an issue, but there's also lowering the standard from what it takes to prosecute an officer because you know, time after time, communities see something that has happened, an encounter that led to death, and then the officer not even being prosecuted. So are you willing to give on the qualified immunity issue in order to get a bill passed? Well, as of right now, no, uh, for two reasons. <laughs> Number one, it's not really appropriate to negotiate in public. But two, it's too early because the way we are viewing this bill is that we are not going to agree to anything until we agree to everything. And that adds to the fact that it's a comprehensive bill. Let me tell you another uh, area that I think is really critical, and that is the registry, a national registry where the public has access to see if it's an officer that was problematic. We need a registry so communities can see and so that officers can't just bounce around from one department to another. We won't agree to anything until we agree to everything. What does that mean? Right. What that means is, is that we want to lay out all of the components of the bill so looking at the measures to hold officers accountable, another part of the bill talks about raising standards for policing. And so having national training, accreditation, 
There's another part of the bill that looks at grants for communities. And so laying out the entire bill and going through it and seeing where we are. And of course, it's my goal and desire that we hold the entire bill together and that we don't lose pieces of it. Uh, what is South Carolina Senator Tim Scott like to negotiate with? Well, you know, I have really enjoyed building a relationship with him. First of all, we came in together. Um, he was in the House at that time, and he, you know, he's moved over to the Senate. But, you know, I find him to be an honest broker. He's in a very tough situation. He's up for re-election next year in a tough state um, as the only African-American Republican uh, in the Senate. You know, you can imagine the pressure that is on him. But, uh, but he's been a good partner. And so we've been looking at the reality that he faces because he is key. Uh, you know we need 60 votes in order to pass it in the Senate. And Mitch McConnell has essentially anointed him to negotiate on behalf of the Senate Republicans. So it's not just his opinions that he has to weigh when he's making decisions about the bill. He has to put it in the context of, if I go along with this one provision, will it still allow me to get nine other votes uh, on the side? But I think between the people that are at the table talking, there's a high degree of trust and transparency between uh, our group. So it's taking a while, but I do believe that we will get there. You know, you were on The Issue Is exactly a year ago this week. You were on yeah. just hours before the big riots broke out in Southern California after George Floyd's death. This is what you said. That that officer had had his knee on the neck of an animal, on a dog, and killed the, per killed the animal over eight minutes. There would be absolute outrage about animal cruelty. The problem is, is that when it is an African-American, the immediate question is, what did he do? He had to have done something. So we're a year later now. We have seen mass protests. We've seen Derek Chauvin convicted of murder. Where, yes. where do you think we're at? And do you think we've had real progress? Well, I think it's been a give and take. You know, I think we certainly had real progress in California and in Los Angeles and, and in other cities. So one of the things that, that has happened, we might not have been successful so far on the federal side, but all of the momentum from all of the outpouring has absolutely uh, allowed change to take place in many states and in many local jurisdictions. And so now it's our obligation on, on the federal side to meet that same standard. And everything that I said then, I absolutely uh, still believe. So I do think that there is change in the air, but that change is still underway. We have much, much more uh, that needs to happen. You met once again with George Floyd's family this week. T take us inside the room. Uh, what did you say to them? I, you know, offered them condolences, apologized for having not gotten the job done but assured them that I would get it done. Uh, when I had a moment to speak to Mr. Floyd's daughter, um, I told her that, you know, she had wished that her father would have changed the world. I told her that he did change the world, and I believe that. It really is remarkable, but I have to say, after talking with you, I feel like we are closer to getting some reform done than I was before talking with you. <laughs> it seems uh, well, more, more optimistic, <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel that way now, too, because I just finished a meeting that made me feel a lot more hopeful. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good breaking news here. Uh, before we go, we want to let people know about a special documentary series that both the Congresswoman and myself were interviewed for that's available to stream right now. It is called Rising Up. It's a five-part series looking at George Floyd's death, the riots afterwards, where we go from here. It's available for streaming on FoxLA.com, YouTube, Tubi, Fox News Now, Fox Soul. A special shout out to The Issue Is editor Debbie Kim and producer Nick Greitzer for their tireless work to make this extraordinary project come to life. And uh, thanks to the Congresswoman for her part in that and for your part here today on The Issue Is. Always great to see you, Congresswoman Karen Bass. Always good to be with you. Still to come? Actress Mira Sorvino is with us with a direct appeal to Governor Gavin Newsom regarding human trafficking. Stay with us. I went on Alex Michelson's show and talked very, very specifically about what each one of these laws meant to us. Well, thank God he did sign three of the bills that I was writing him about into law. Back in 2018, actress Mira Sorvino joined us on The Issue Is to lobby then-Governor Jerry Brown on legislation. Well, now it's 2021. She's back to lobby the current governor, Gavin Newsom. 
She's joined by advocates tackling the issue of human trafficking. Mira Sorvino is an Oscar-winning actress and a United Nations goodwill ambassador to combat human trafficking, joining us from her daughter's room. Uh, Miguel Santiago is a Democratic Assemblyman from Boyle Heights and a member of the Health and Public Safety Committees. And Jenna McKay is a human trafficking survivor who founded her own foundation to educate others about the issue. Welcome all to The Issue Is. Mara, welcome back. Let's start with you. And where does the passion for this particular issue come from? I have always had a passion for uh, the otherization of people and to their reduction to being treated as less than human. And human trafficking is the ultimate turning a person into something less than human in the eyes of the person who's exploiting them. And I have met trafficking survivors since 2004 um, who have broken my heart with their terrible stories of exploitation, both sex and labor, and then inspired me with their incredible bravery and courage and strength um, to help leave no person behind who's still in bondage. And Jenna, you are one of those survivors that has inspired Mira so much. Can you tell us briefly your story and your main message? Um, yes, so I um, survived trafficking 15 years ago, and then it wasn't as much talked about now. And when I got away from um, that situation, I went to a hospital um, to receive help, and nobody identified me and created a safe place for me um, to receive that support. So I wasn't offered any resources or services, which made my healing journey that much harder. Yeah, and Assemblyman, the, the governor recently announced more than $100 billion in new spending. You specifically are asking for $10 million. What would that money do, and where are you at in terms of getting that money? The Assembly has uh, uh, put it on the agenda, so we feel comfortable there. Uh, but we're fine for this money because it's basic food and housing assistance. And we know that during this pandemic uh, has worsened the situation, uh, whereas people have been uh, stolen, held against their own will, uh, and made to do horrific things uh, for those who have exploited them. So are, are you seeing pushback from your colleagues? I mean, does this seem like it's going to happen? It sounds like kind of a no-brainer. Well, look, here's what happens, and here's why we're fighting hard, because uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of requests, hundreds of pressures. And what we're trying to do here is, is help some of the most vulnerable communities. And when you take a look at a request like $10 million uh, compared to a budget that goes over uh, $200 billion, we're really asking for budget dust uh, for those who are uh, most impacted and those who are most vulnerable, human trafficking victims. Jenna, as a human trafficking victim, uh, can you look directly in the camera? And, and what is your main message for the governor and for the legislature? This is so needed. And it's, you know, we, victims often feel that they're not seen and not heard and not cared about. And we want to send the message to them that they are and that there are support and services and resources available. And Mira, your main message. Governor Newsom, I know in the past you have shown support for human trafficking victims. You did enact into law a bill that would help human trafficking victims in the past. And I know that this is close to your heart. Please don't let this community get left out of this enormous, you know, well-intended budget relief for COVID-19. We're saying, no, California does not tolerate this. We are going to fight human trafficking and human trafficking, not allow it to flourish under these conditions and leave these most vulnerable California residents out in the cold. Please, Governor Newsom, please include this in your budget push. Uh, we appreciate the passion and also, on a lighter note, appreciate the passion of your cat uh, to be a part of the segment <laughs> as well <laughs> behind you. And while we're uh, on a lighter note, uh, you're busy on so many different projects right now, Mira. You're currently playing Monica Lewinsky's mom for a new series about Bill Clinton's impeachment. The Daily Mail put up these pictures. That, that's me and Beanie Feldstein um, being shot by paparazzi from across the street. Um, you can see that my look is pretty different, but I look a lot like Marsha Lewis did her mother at the time. And boy, was this family victimized. Um, whatever you thought you knew about this situation, it is unbelievable what Kenneth Starr's you know, independent counsel investigation put this particular family through when it really it was all on Bill Clinton. The mom is so wonderful. She's such a wonderful mother and really smart and really protective like the ultimate mama bear. 
but really powerless in the face of the government to help her daughter evade this suffering. So it's, it's going to be a really interesting view on what happened. Um, really interesting after the whole Me Too perspective suit, just to see the, the imbalance of power and how the women in this story were basically sort of pawns um, to try and take down the president. But it, it, it's very, uh, very interesting. Well, that's a side of the story that hasn't been told enough. And this story about human trafficking, unfortunately, has not been told enough as well. We appreciate all three of you coming on to help share that story. Uh, and best of luck to you all with the legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, Politico calls him the most influential activist in America. Our conversation with one of the most moving and inspiring we have ever had, Adi Barkin, still to come on the issue list. Next week on The Issue Is, we talk to the man behind the top-selling political book in America, and it is a juicy one. It is called Battle for the Soul. It takes you in the room for the biggest moments of the 2020 election. Author Edward Isaac Dover is with us next week. But still to come this week, one of my favorite interviews of all time, Adi Barkin. Stick around. It's next. Text vote to 30330 to learn how to vote safely, because our lives depend on it. Adi Barkin gathered national attention during that speech before the Democratic National Convention. He's now turning his attention to California politics. We spoke this week, and it's a conversation I'll never forget. It means a lot to so many people. You give hope. You give hope. Politico magazine called Adi Barkin the most powerful activist in America while acknowledging he's dying of ALS. Hi, Adi. Oh, I'm so happy hello, to hello. see you. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Welcome he's earned FaceTime with many of the most powerful people in the country, <laughs> and it's often emotional. Um, give me a second. You know, Adi, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Before ALS, Adi graduated from Columbia and Yale Law School and became a successful progressive activist. At just 32 years old, Adi was a married, new father living in Santa Barbara when everything changed. I was diagnosed with ALS today, which is a deadly, debilitating disease. Out of the clear blue sky, we were struck by lightning. We spoke with Adi through a system where he uses his eyeballs to type messages. I began organizing for collective action because I could not bear to live in a reality that accepted the alternative. Living with ALS deepened Adi's commitment to universal health care. He realized far too many die too quickly because they simply can't afford medical help like he can. Democracy is beautiful. Democracy is beautiful. He's taken his message to Capitol Hill and even confronted then-Senator Jeff Flake on a plane. You can save my life. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. He's testified before Congress. Thanks so much for having us over. Thank you for coming. And invited presidential candidates to his home. He asked about their personal struggles with the health care system. For Pete Buttigieg, the loss of his dad. This is the first time I've, uh, um, sorry. This is the first time I've been around a lot of breathing equipment since we lost my father in January. For Kamala Harris, her mom's cancer. She took our hands and she said she'd been diagnosed with colon cancer. That was one of the worst days of my life, truly. Remember the words to this day, we found a spot. Adi's newest interview series focuses on California politics. It includes U.S. Senator Alex Padilla talking about his own brain surgery after a pre-aneurysm. So I get to the state Senate, literally my freshman year as a senator, and what's the hot topic being discussed and debated? Health care. What was the main message you want people to take from that? If you choose your constituents over multi-billion dollar health care corporations that profit off of death and illness, you can save millions of lives. Mm. What will you choose? Adi doesn't always agree with his guests. It's no secret that I support Medicare for all. I don't. Hello, America. Still, My Barkin spoke Barkin. at the Democratic I National Convention for cycle. Biden and is hopeful President Biden will expand funding for ALS research 
and lower the eligibility for Medicare from 65 to 55 years old. I urge those of you listening to imagine the world as you believe it could be and then grab a few friends and get to work to create that world. Can you talk about how your kids influence your activism? <laughs> Daddy. I may not live to see us win every fight I've taken on, but I know one day someone will. Mm. Perhaps that someone will be my children or yours. Mm. And that's motivation enough for me. Hey, Kyle, it's me, Dad. He showed Senator Cory Booker a video he recorded for his son. All that matters to me is to make you proud of your old dad. That's very beautiful. How would you describe your legacy? Nothing lasting and nothing worthwhile is done alone. I have learned that it is through collective struggle that we find personal liberation. Though I am dying of ALS, I realized that I could transcend my body by hitching my future to yours. I could make meaning even out of my ALS. And together, we could make meaning out of our time on Earth. Hmm. Whatever you think of his politics, you can't deny that Adi Barkin is an extraordinary force. We've been lucky to meet a lot of inspiring people on this show, but Adi might be the most inspiring of them all. We end this week with music from Bob Dylan, who celebrated his 80th birthday this week. And we pair that with images of Adi's activism. I'm Alex Michelson. Thanks for watching The Issuers. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled The battle outside raging Will soon shake your windows and rattle your walls For the times they are a-changing